Welcome back, everybody, uh, on uh, a kind of cloudy day today. Uh, and today, uh, actually, uh, we're going to be doing something a little different. Uh, I threw out um, just a random question uh, on Facebook, and a lot of people had uh, tons of questions. And I'm really glad that you guys all had uh, some input on that, some feedback. Uh, so today, what I'm going to do is actually demonstrate some drills that you can do at home. But I also want to open up for any questions that you might have. I'll address some of the questions that uh, were put out there. Uh, but I feel like it's better kind of just, um, you know, and again, uh, in my opinion, that's kind of where I'll go with the feedback. So I hope that sounds good. Uh, but once again, um, I'm going to make sure that I thank uh, you know, my sponsor Prince, uh, but also Pickleball Central. Uh, today, as you guys are gonna see, uh, they not only are we doing uh, the paddle giveaway, which I'll let Eddie talk about at the end of the, of the live stream, uh, but also um, we have a net uh, that Edward sent it for me, uh, which again, Landon and I will be using it in the living room. Uh, but for today is actually a really good uh, for, uh, really good tool for what I'm about to do with the wall. So uh, again, I'm doing it outside. Uh, if you wanna do it in the garage, I think this is perfect. Uh, and if you are by yourself, I think that is a great drill to do it at home. Uh, but anyways, Eddie, I'll, I'll uh, leave it to you to explain about the contest, please. Pretty, That's please. right. Before we get into the contest, I do wanna remind you that you can use coupon code Simone20 for 20% off any Prince Paddles at either pickleballcentral.com or princepickleball.com. And that is good until April 30th. And that's right, we have another Prince Paddle that we wanna be able to give away today. And once again, to become eligible, to be picked for the drawing of winning that Prince Paddle, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and share this live stream on Facebook. Now you can share multiple times and each time you share, that does make you eligible to be in the drawing as we are picking this randomly. So go ahead and, and share this out so that all of your pickleball loving friends and family are able to watch this amazing live stream we're gonna be doing here today. All right, perfect, awesome. Sorry, as you can see, this is a family affair. Uh, I'm not sure what Landon's up to. Uh, but anyways, so um, also uh, I am wearing a dress today. I have to say this is Lucy's doing. It is her birthday. So don't forget to wish her, her, her happy birthday. Go on her uh, wall and just get happy birthday all over her wall. Uh, so I had to wear a dress. That is not something, this has been in my closet now. Uh, and I have not put on a, a, a pickleball, a tennis dress, pickleball dress uh, since my last tournament. So there you have it. So I hope you happy, Luce. Uh Happy birthday to you. Uh, and again, um, you know, uh, just make sure that all of you guys go and wish her happy birthday. Um, the other part, uh, before I get started, uh, that I wanted to talk about, and Addie will help me out here. Um, uh, some of you may or may not know, but I have, um, I have, I'm, have two brothers. Uh, I am the youngest of three. And my older brother, uh, Marcelo Jardim, uh, he is a paddle player, padel, uh, in Spain. And uh, he... Um, has been going through some pretty difficult times. I know a lot of people, uh, when I we decided as a family to stay home uh, three weeks ago, it's been three weeks that we've been home, um, we um, had something uh, with the virus hit really close to home uh, with my brother and his family. And um, they are doing well, thank goodness. Uh, thank, thank the Lord for that. Uh, but, um, what I wanted to show you guys is that tomorrow, I mean, it's, it is in Spanish, so some of you uh, may or may not understand, uh, but tomorrow uh, at nine o'clock, I believe, uh, nine o'clock time in Spain, which if you take six, I'm, I've been working on math with Alexa, so I should be able to do this, uh, which is uh, three o'clock, 3 p.m. Uh, Florida time. Uh, he's gonna be doing a live stream on uh, Instagram uh, talking about what it's been like um, going through coronavirus, having a baby. Uh, and again, it's been really stressful for all of us, but we're very thankful that everybody's doing well. So again, did you, by any chance, were able to put that on the screen there? Yeah, you can see uh, how to follow Marcelo on Instagram there. His um, the URL to his Instagram page is up there right yep. now. 
and that's tomorrow monday uh and it, he'll go live and and again it's in spanish but uh um again uh i that's that's all i have to say about that and uh uh so we'll get started so here's uh some of the questions we're talking about is there a way to practice ground strokes when you are at home uh to me the best way if you uh have a wall uh that you can do it uh i would say that again uh, there's there's a couple ways i um Again, I like to set a target when it comes to ground strokes is making sure that you keep that ball pretty low. So how I set up the net, I actually set up the net a little bit further away from the wall because then I can do several drills uh, with ground strokes and actually you can get a ton of movement. So I'm going to give you a few here. So I don't know. Hopefully you can still get me. I know this as it gets further away, um, it gets a little harder to he hear me. But again, I. I'm out of little space here, uh, and again, uh, if you have more space with the garage, you can probably open up, uh, uh, find more space. Uh, the way that I set up is that I put the net a little further away, and then I have, I'm using Landon's target there to work on my ground strokes. Now, again, uh, it's going to require, the ball does not come back as far, oh, yeah, as it does. If you were to be doing, I again, unfortunately I have the pavers, but on a flatter wall, this could be really, wow, that's not good. But this would be pretty realistic for you because you would have a harder surface and a straight surface. As you can see, I'm guessing here, my footwork will have to be good. Um, now, this is, again, uh, I just so you know, growing up, I did this a lot for tennis uh, and it helps a ton for repetition. But again, if you're getting that repetition, making sure that you're working on the technique, working on your control, that is the most important thing. So it, when it comes to, to technique, and I know that we talked about, we did, uh, we did a video. Uh, when was that, Eddie? We did the, the, forehand, to the forehand top spin. That was uh, a few videos ago. Yep. A couple months ago. So a couple months ago. So if you want to find that one, uh, and again, I'll take questions right now if anybody has any. Uh, so think about questions when it comes to the, to the ground stroke. But ultimately, when you're hitting against the wall, uh, you are going to get a ton of repetition. I, when I was little, that's when I was that guy's age, six years old. That's how I actually learned how to play tennis. Uh, and when it comes to, I think, the most similar stroke to tennis, it is the ground stroke. That is the closest to tennis that you're going to get. Again, I simplified my stroke from tennis to pickleball, adapting, not making a loop or not doing such a big swing. Uh, but some of it are very, very similar as far as my low to high movement and my footwork. So I think that is a great practice to get that repetition. Um, the other one, and again, uh, this is something that then it becomes even more realistic how do i get to practice some third shot drops well you're going to need extra balls for this one so how i would do it how i would start and again let's see if i don't hit the table but well how i would do it is that i would hit a ground stroke first and then i would set it up and try to hit that ball there so ground stroke third shot drop but that was not a good drop and there you go and again this is a little bit more realistic when I'm hitting. There you go. And as, I, as you can see, the difference here, and you can, if you have more space, you can even put the net uh, a little bit closer to you and actually do the seven, excuse me, do the seven feet on the other side and put some targets, whatever you want to do. But that would be a, the best way to go about it. So. And see, I even have somebody to pick up the ball, so it's perfect for me. <laughs> so again, I'm going ground stroke and then a drop shot. Thank you, Bubba. Just watch the back. And there you go. And then I can also go to my back end. And that was definitely not good. Let's try again. There you go. Ground stroke. The shot drop a little better. Thank you. There you go. Ground stroke drop, ground stroke, drop. So again, 
yeah. So, so with that, uh, to me, it becomes a little bit more realistic of the fact that you're hitting a ground stroke. So the ball is going to come a little faster and you can mix it up. If you, again, depends on how much space you have, then you can move even more, get your feet, uh, and then make sure that you, again, you're working on that technique. Um, one of the most important things when you're doing this is that, that you have a goal. Uh, don't just go out and just be banging balls against the wall. Uh, and then, you know, it tends to then get a little too big. I like to see you stay compact when you're doing that. Make it as realistic as possible when the technique being a little bit more sound versus doing, you know, if you do 100 of them and they are not that great, then, again, you're kind of wasting your time and developing some bad habits. Um, so questions so far. I actually, I had a question for me, Simone, and that is, are you switching yeah. from continental to semi-Western grip during that drill, maybe for the more advanced players yeah. who, who play that way? Yeah, so so I've always done it, and that's one thing that I've talked about with a lot of clients. I've talked about how it is all personal. In, the, my, in my opinion, it, you have to develop what's going to be best for you. So if you have a continental grip on your forehand, then you continue to do it and it, it's working well. Uh, a lot of the times when we talk about with players who maybe had a, you know, they have a continental grip, but they're, they're hitting the ball a little bit too underneath it and then the ball is sailing out. That's when we try to then come over a little, just adjust and come over a little bit more either Eastern or for me, I have a little bit more exaggerated semi-Western so I can put more top spin. So again, Eddie, it, it's all up to what what is it that your forehand is going to look like? What is it that you want to work on? I mean, to me, like if you want to develop a more a top spin forehand, this would be the best time to do it because you can do this repetition against the wall many, many times and actually get the technique down uh, before you can you know, go back out on the courts. Um, so, so to answer your question, yes, I am switching back and forth and it's something that I've always done. It comes very natural to me. Um, and it will take lots and lots of repetition because I hit with a semi-western on my, on my forehand and then I go to the continental on my backhand. So again, if I was to do it, so if I was to mix it up and hopefully my pavers cooperate here with me, I have to hit it like in the perfect spot. So let's say if I was to hit a forehand and then I switch. And then because again, because I went to the continental, then the drop is the same grip. I, I drop and I hit dinks with that same continental grip. But you can, it's very, like a lot of people, unless they are really watching my hand, it's the only way that you can see that I'm making that change. So I'm here, now I switch, and now I'm on continental. So it's a very small adjustment. Can you even see it watching from there? Eddie? No, no, you, maybe you should show um, your grip with your hand, but there you go. So, so yeah, so when I go here, a lot of the times it comes over there. So I go from there to there. Gotcha. So it's here and then there. And again, for me, it helps a lot when I go to, sorry, when I go to the two hand back end, it helps because my left hand does the, the switch. So. Awesome. Thank you. We, ha we have a few other questions yep. here, if this is a good time to ask them. Yep. Uh, this is Absolutely. one from Scott2335476. Uh, Scott wants to know, how does your stucco hold up to ground strokes? Uh, honestly, I've hit some balls pretty hard, and it's been okay. Uh, it is... Um, I, I can tell you that I don't have any damage. That damage there is from Landon with uh, whatever he was, he had a pick or something. Uh, so for the most part, it has not done any damage and I've done, I've hit a lot of balls. The kids have hit some balls against it. So again, it, it's, I don't know if hitting, you know, a thousand balls, how it would hold up, hold up. But um, the other thing that I know that we talked a little bit about it is that if that is an issue, uh, consider uh, going with a softer ball. Just know that when you go to the, especially when you're doing foam ball, uh, that the issue becomes that when, because of the fact that you're going to be swinging it harder, uh, faster, that you don't want to do too many because then you end up with a, short, a sore shoulder. Uh, which again reminds me of a question that I had. Uh, some people have asked me about tennis elbow 
uh, and uh, you know, wrist, tennis elbow, shoulder, kind of to me, it goes a little bit together. Uh, a lot of the times, not a lot of the times, but some of the times the issues that we see, especially for ground strokes, is the late contact point. So whenever you're making contact with the ball, sorry, I'll back up a little bit. So if I make contact with the ball behind my hip, it puts a lot of um, stress on my elbow. And then sometimes what happens is that you overcompensate by using your wrist. And then that's when we end up with a little bit of a wrist problem. So when it comes to the ground strokes and affecting your elbow, if you feel any kind of, you know, a sharp pain or any kind of pain on the elbow, try to focus on getting that ball further out in front. So you're using more of your shoulder and your core versus only the elbow and the wrist. So that was one of the questions. Uh, as far as if, you, if you're feeling uh, that uh, elbow pain uh, throughout volleys, uh, oftentimes we see that it's from holding that paddle really, really hard uh, with a lot of pressure. And again, kind of the same way, taking big swings and contact point is behind. That puts, again, that stress on the elbow. Um, and that tends, sometimes it tends to be a uh, technique as well, but but for for what we see most of the time is contact point. Awesome. Uh, we have another question here from Karen Stein, and Karen wants to know yep. any suggestions on how I can keep my wrist from twisting on my forehand dink when hitting straight ahead when I make contact with the ball. So there is a few because it's funny how our body works, and to me, some of the things that that we 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 have so many different kind of learners. Uh, our students, they, you know, our clients, our students, uh, they, a lot of the times they learn differently. So some people, they are visual. Some people are more um, fe feelers, like they, they need to fe feel their body. So if you are a visual, uh, some of them do really well watching somebody else do it. Uh, sometimes what you need to do is actually film yourself and take a look at yourself doing it and, and then you'll see, okay, what, why is it that I'm doing that? And, and again, uh, you, you're, this is visual learning. Uh, for some that are more of that touch, they need to feel what their body is doing. So something that you are already aware of, you're already aware of yourself flicking your wrist. So one thing that I would recommend, again, sorry, can I get my balls here? Sometimes a good way is actually like, we're gonna go back to the, to, to the dinking wall here, is to actually hold your wrist when you are, just li like lightly hold that wrist. So when you're dinking, just kind of put your, your uh, opposite hand. And again, I'm feeling, so the moment that I start to use my wrist, your body sensory in that sense is going to tell you, okay, I'm flicking my wrist. So, so what I want you to focus on is again, okay, what is, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So, so, so if you twisting and you're closing your wrist, I'm hoping that by doing that, and again, there's many ways that you can think about it too. If I was to hit that ball with my hand, that's where I would be thinking, okay, I can't move my wrist because if I do, then I'm going to completely miss that ball. So uh, translating that into putting the paddle, again, I'm going to go back to holding, holding my wrist. And one good way that I found, um, in my opinion, is that we, uh, how can we, how can I be in, um, in, in somebody's shoes a lot of the times? Uh, because again, most of the pros, they don't even have to think of the way they hit the, the ball. They just do. Um, it's something that comes natural. So something that doesn't come natural for me is hitting the ball left-handed, which is really hard, actually. So a lot of the times, okay, why is it that I have the need to use my wrist? And a lot of the times it's because I'm trying to hit the ball. The moment I start to hit the ball harder, ah, and there he goes, bye. The moment that I start to hit the ball harder, that's when you notice that the wrist starts to go like it's being overused. So, so really focus on softening the ball 
and I hope I, I'm making sense because I know I can talk all day, but, but really softening that, that, that grip and softening the ball and having a feel. You want to feel that ball through your paddle as you keep that wrist lay back and not going forward and or over. I think that, that was, uh, yeah, okay. that was very well said. Yep. I'm actually going to try that drill myself, Simone. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, I'm telling you it's because everybody learns differently until, you know, sometimes uh, it takes a little while to figure out, to figure somebody out. Uh, and, and some people don't know, they don't know, but, but always try to go back to, uh, and again, uh, Chad and I are going back to school or in fifth grade all over again, but, but go back to what is your learning like your style uh some people like to see it i want to see it in front of me i want to make sure that you know i i see how it's done and then i work on it uh some people they like to be walked through okay here this is what you have to do and they maybe their, their pen needs to be on the paper so just kind of try to figure out what kind of learning you are. And maybe some, some people are all together. They, they need both. They need to see it and they need to feel it. Um, so maybe a combination of watching yourself play and then kind of getting a feel for um, that risk. And, and I, I hear all the time when people come back and they tell me, oh my gosh, that's what I look like when I play. Uh, that's probably just been one of... Uh, one of the sentences that I hear a lot when they see themselves playing. Um, and again, it's, 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 I think it's funny the way I play, because when I look at myself, we're very critical of ourselves, but they try to look at the technique versus anything else. So. We have another question here Good. from Gerald Swit and Gerald wants to know what is your favorite outdoor outdoor ball to use? Um, and I'm assuming for uh, drills right now, which one? Um, I've used, I have in the bag, I have, I'm like, I, my, my political answer, I have both, uh, I have both the, the Dura and the Franklin. Uh, and again, uh, both of them have done fine. Uh, for sure. The, the, this, the, the Franklin is a little easier on the dinks because of the fact that it's, it is bouncing pretty nicely on my pavers. Uh, the one thing about the Dura, because of the fact that I want the ball to come back a little bit more with the with how far i'm hitting the ground strokes so the dura is going to to have a little bit more juice on it which again i want it to come back to me so is that is that a good good answer right there i like it <laughs> so oh, we have a, a question let me from... show another yeah oh, go ahead sorry i'm back i'm about go ahead go ahead okay uh we have a question here from kimberly joe york and Kimberly, Kimberly says, I've had to switch from my dominant hand to my weak due to a shoulder injury. Any recommendations yep. on how to learn to adjust? I've never played anything with my non-dominant arm. Uh, oh my goodness. So uh, I think there are a lot of benefits actually to working with your non-dominant arm. Um, I think in the fact that, uh, and again, I not like, pro on this but i know that uh there are uh research there is research out there that you by working on your non-dominant that your dominant side actually assimilates is that the word that i'm trying to use yeah so so actually it's not a bad thing so if you're working with your so let's say this person is right-hander and they're working left-handed actually the right side is also working um assimilating on what that side is doing now Again, it's much harder to go with your non-dominant hand. Uh, you, you know, it's going to take a while to get as good as your dominant hand. But also, in a way, maybe your shoulder will heal. Because sometimes, you know, some of the injuries that we have is because of overuse. Uh, and pickleball, just like a lot of sports, overuse doing the same movement over and over again. So maybe this is something that you'll be able to rest uh, just make sure that when you do go back, that maybe doing some rehab to strengthen certain muscles around your your shoulder, uh, that's something that helps a lot of athletes. Just making sure that, again, you're not irritating, not, infl like not causing inflammation, but you are actually strengthening muscles around it. So that way, when you do go back to your dominant hand, it won't hurt again. 
So, but my biggest advice is, you know, if that's what you have, work with it and have fun while it, doing it because it's, I'll tell you, it's not going to be easy. That's for sure. So I'll go back to, I'll, I'll do an, another couple of drills here because there were some people talking about uh, resetting and this defending uh, and you can do that against the wall. Uh, let me find the ball here a little newer. Okay, so one of the things, again, when I'm doing this, uh, and sorry, we, I didn't uh, mark it, but if I'm going to do this, I can do it from um, seven feet from the, the, from the net, and I can, do, I can hit a ball hard and then work on my block. So it's kind of similar, but now I'm really, I'm not doing this repetition wise, uh, back and forth with, with the net. So, sorry, with the, with the wall. So I'm gonna hit the ball hard and then work on my block. Uh, and again, I recommend you having quite a few balls uh, so you can get that done. So, so let's say we've worked on ground strokes. We've done uh, a little bit of a groundy, uh, ground stroke uh, dink uh, combo. And now we can actually kind of bring it all together. So if you want to do it, uh, there's many ways that you can do it. So let's say I hit the first ball, right? I hit a groundy. Then I got that. Then I go hard again. Wow, that was a pop-up and a half. That would have been me getting killed. Uh, so now since I, I did that poorly, let's go one more time. So I go that. Got it. Okay. There you go. Okay, now I go here. Oh, that was a little better. So again, you kind of doing some, um, making it a little bit more real uh, with with the with the wall. Uh, some people I know have talked about, have asked that they they doing with ball machines. That's something that you can definitely set up a ball machine on the side and do that. Uh, I know. Wes has been lucky enough to be doing it. Uh, a lot of stuff with a ball machine, uh, just him ball machine uh, in a warehouse. That's awesome uh, because again, you get that repetition. Just so again, making sure that you're getting uh, that technique, uh, setting up your feet. Um, so then uh, talking about defense. Sorry. So I'll add, so again, I'm just adding. Now I've got three balls. Hopefully you can hold three balls. Uh, so now I'm gonna go to, to I'm gonna combine everything. So now I've gone ground stroke, drop, block, and then let's say block. So again, I can get that same combo, getting three balls in play now, okay? Uh, and then if you wanna work on your put away, you do the same thing, except what, it, what would be my third feed then? My third feed would be a much easier ball. So I'll go my ground stroke, my drop, my block, and now, wow, that did not work how I want it. So anyway, so then again, work on keeping that ball down. And as you move forward, just making sure that you're not taking big swings. Just because you're hitting with a wall, I would not like worry too much of hitting the ball so hard and with such a big back swing, focusing on staying compact. So... Questions, concerns? There's um, kind of a, a strategy question that was asked here from Dr. Jessica Page. Dr. Jessica wants to know, do you play to your team's strengths or exploit the other team's weaknesses? Uh, always weakness. Uh, so I, I feel like you can be playing really, really well. Uh, so... Just can you can you read the question again for me? Sorry. Yeah. Do do you play to your team's strengths or exploit the other team's weaknesses? Yeah. So so that's what I thought it was. So again, it, you can go either way on this. It depends. It depends on what's working and what's not. So let's say we are playing to our strengths. Uh, so this would be like the worst case scenario where you are playing to your strengths, and let's say it's not working. Uh, they are either reading it well or they are just playing better than you. Uh, so that's when I would then go to their weakness and and adapt with that. Um, of course, like there's so many 
uh, variables on this, but a lot of the times um, it is all about what is going to help you win. So I, I, I've had this, um, I talk about this sometimes where there are days that you you go out and you can't do anything wrong where you just feel so good. Oh my gosh, I like I am, my A game is there. Uh, but that is the day also that your opponent is playing well and your A game is kind of like, kind of like a, it, it suits their style of play. Uh, so that's when, okay, I got to think outside the box here and change it up and maybe not play, you know, maybe it's not going to be that pretty or, or feel that great because of the fact that you're feeling the ball great, but it's not working. So that's when you kind of change your strategy and you go to what works best versus what it feels good. So, and I know that, which again, it will go, um, I'll go to uh, Chris Powers actually um, had this question on Facebook that I wanted to address that she talked about because I, I actually I feel like that's one of my strengths of the like the mentality of when stepping on that court. Um, it, it's she talked about that her question, if I recall, it was um, how do you um, you know, when you get on that big league, sorry, big lead. Uh, and um, how do you keep on going and in, instead of, you know, losing that lead? Um, I think that I, I, we see that a lot uh, where people, uh, they, they, they are up, let's say, nine, th I, I want to say like 9-3 or something like that. And, um, and I think that was the number, actually, that she said. And, and they end up losing that game. Uh, and I think, uh, whew, if I recall, Lucy and I were up. Um, at our tournament uh, about a, a month or so ago and we were up the second game i want to say like a lot like nine nine two, nine, two. Uh, and we ended up losing that game if you remember eddie we made it very very uh difficult and later for everybody uh because then we ended up playing a third game against Catherine and lee and lucy and i were playing phenomenal like we got that lead and we were playing really really well and we fell into that trap where we started doing something that we were not doing before. So when we got to that lead, we played a certain way. But when we got the lead, we kind of like, I don't know, we were, we were feeling good because we were feeling the ball really well. And we started messing, messing around. That's the best way I can describe it. Just doing some silly shots and making errors. And that a lot of the times what creates is, is it creates a problem because now I feel like we were, we totally just screwed up because we gave them the confidence for them to come back to feel like, oh, we still win this. And, and then we started then to play worse because of course you have this lead and now you're, it's in your own head because it's like, what, what did we just do? You know? So that's kind of, to me, one, people either relax and take for granted what the score is. And then they start to just like do different things. Uh, two, uh, one thing that we see a lot. So if it's not broken, don't try to fix it. So let's say if you're doing a certain thing, let's say, um, and I've seen this where um, you got to, you know, nine, three, and you've been hitting third shot drives. Okay. The whole time. And now you decide that on nine three, you're gonna try a drop. And to me, it's like, okay, and, and vice versa. A lot of times it's the other way around that you, you've been dropping, getting in and building the point, constructing the point and winning where then you're like, oh, I'm nine three, fine. You start smacking some ball, balls around just for fun because you're up nine three. And then you end up making unforced errors and you get in trouble. And that's kind of, uh, you know, a mentality shift that you kind of imposed on yourself. You made, you put yourself in that position. Now you, you lose a side out and now they're serving and then they get a few points and now you become a little tighter. You're not playing as freely and your third shot drops maybe are not going in anymore or they're not as good anymore and you start to make errors. So that is kind of you playing a little game with yourself and that, and that, at that point, uh, you're losing to yourself. Uh, and then the third, again, f for me, one of the most important ones is playing not 
to lose versus playing to win. So most of the time, even though this game is still about unforced errors, um, it's still also about taking calculated risks. So a lot of times, the the higher level you go, and actually, no, not really. I mean, we've seen it at all levels. But when you're taking calculated risks, you are attacking the right ball. Most of the time, you're winning. And I think we did talk about that when we did that mixed doubles. Remember, um, we talk about sometimes you guys were doing uh, when it was Eddie, it was uh, you and uh, Mac uh, and Karen and uh, your friend Mark. Mark. And a lot of the times you guys would get a ball that was completely attackable. And instead of attacking it, you guys would just play safe and get and continue with the rally. But you then would turn the tables. And because, again, if I'm losing, I'm like, okay, I'm losing. I have nothing to lose at this point. If you don't want it, then I'm going to take it. And then what would happen is that because you didn't take that shot, didn't ha- take that chance, then all of a sudden the, your opponents would attack it and win the point. Um, so that is a shift in mentality that now you're playing not to lose. You're protecting your score versus playing to win. Um, and that's something that you you just got to do it. You know, when you get in those tough deci- like tough moments uh, and, and making those shots, you just got to go for it and trust and, and, and continue to trust your shots and trust yourself and your partner. Uh, because, again, um, I, I, I always say I rather lose going for it then lose knowing that I didn't take the chances when I had them. So that's kind of having the mentality, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to play this sucker to win. That's what I'm going for. So those are, I hope that helps. I think it's good stuff. Um, we do have another kind of strategy question here from Lala, and she yep. wants to know, do you stack when you play and what determines your decision? Oh, there's a lot of factors for stacking, but most importantly is um, what is going to, again, set set up the play how we want it to go. So, uh, you know, normally I stack both uh, mix and women's doubles and they, you know, they're played differently. And to me is is playing to the strengths of my, my, my partners, but also being able to play that way, we can definitely move the ball in a way that we're going to be able to dictate how the play goes, how we want the play to go. And then that way we are definitely being able to pick on the weaknesses of our opponents. Uh, But with that, it it is all about strategy, you know, and then some of it to tactics going into having to change things up. Sometimes it's good to change things up if they're not working, but for the most part, uh, I like to stack. Awesome. Uh, and then going and, back. And again, to, oh, with, with yeah, sorry, I'll go, I'll go back to that because, um, I know I, I, we have a lot of lefty clients and, uh, they always say, oh, should I always stack because I'm a lefty? And my question is, is, you know, always and never are two words that I'll rather not try not to use. Because again, if let's say you're always stacking as a lefty, uh, but it's not working, uh, maybe changing it up and going regular. Uh, yeah, you might open up the middle, middle, but but do you have gonna have two backhands through the middle? But maybe because they've been so used to going wide on you, now all of a sudden you're getting forehands. So just something to think about as well. It, it's very situ- situational of where you are in that you know in the moment. So that's where the strategy like then then maybe you went into with a strategy but then your tactics have to change at the time you're playing great uh kind of going back to your drills you had the block shot drill and orlena wants to know do you have a target when you're doing this block shot drill or maybe not yes. even a drill maybe so just a block shot not- in general yeah, to me, the most important thing is to get that ball to go to the feet. So, like I said, the one thing that I don't have here, uh, but I could potentially get, and where's my, so I have it here. So I have lined up over there just for the ground strokes. It's a little bit harder. I should be it. 
Oh, this is my seven. Never mind. So again, that's my, wow, that looks so far. That kitchen is huge. So when I'm doing this, uh, if you want to do it with the seven feet, it's just a matter of where, like I said, I don't have a whole lot of space here. But if I was to do it, what I would want to try, and I'm going to have to hit this ball pretty hard. Sorry, just come this way. So, oh, that's not going to work. So my, my wall is not really kicking back to me too fast. But if you were to do it, I think with this one, you might need to do it with a partner. I know she's got a great, her husband placed, uh, Greg. Is that right? Craig. 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 So Craig and you can do this at home. If you have a net, uh, I would focus when you're doing those, those blocks is to get that ball to go to his feet. So my goal here, it would be to get that ball right there when I'm blocking. Um, and again, that helps him also. What is his option then when he gets that ball? He's preferably he should try to dink that ball back and then you can start over again where he attacks it and then you block it back to the feet. Um, sometimes people talk about, oh, I want my block to go into the kitchen. Again, just be careful because it's such a fine line. Uh, if I hit a block and the ball kind of comes up, but it's here, you can still attack that or your opponent can still attack you. So that's where sometimes keeping the ball lower, uh, but and, and even if it's got a little bit of pace, but it goes to the feet, uh, to me, is a much better ball. So That's great. Uh, yep. There's a question from Jane. And Jane wants to know, one. Simone, could you please Jane. show some tips on converting okay. oh. from one hand backhand to two handed backhand, thinking this is a good time to pick up this skill? So. It sounds like she's looking to know how, 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 to, how to go from one to Jane yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and again, I've worked, uh, I've, I've, I've worked, uh, uh, in person with Jane. Uh, and the one thing, uh, I would say again, it's, uh, it would be a, a good time is, is really focusing on that base as well, because sometimes that jumping, I know we talked about this, but staying a little bit more on the toes and using the ground, instead of jumping up yeah so but this is the other part so so this is the part where not only again you want to make sure that you're using your body but that second hand should just come for that push because she wants to do it i think she was looking to do it on the volley or is it the ground stroke what is is jane talking about the volley or on the groundy i don't know if jane if you're still out there let us know which one you're talking about there because I think with the volley, one thing is that sometimes the, the arm coming into the body, that's where she was having problem generating power. So having that ground and then using that hand, the left hand to push forward, that would be a really good start. Like where she is with the, where you are, Jane, with the back end, just use the left hand to push forward for that power. And you can do this with the wall, no, no doubt about it. And I can. Yeah, if you want to maybe show a couple, that'd be great. Oh, and uh, yeah, Jane so, actually so again, said both. She wanted to clarify it's for both ground both? strokes. Both. Okay. Yeah. So with the with the volley. So a lot of the times, again, I'm not over swinging, but it's a push, 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 push. So, yeah. So the left arm is going forward. It's pushing forward when I hit. Because again, when if you do go to the groundy with a two-hander, is that that left hand is going to have to do a lot of work. It needs, that left arm needs to come through. So if I'm doing, and again, oh, I'll just leave it. I'll have some net balls here. But if I'm doing my back end, it's not going to come back. So a lot of the times what people, like, when you do, the reason why, a lot of the women hit with the two hand back end is because it's two arms doing the job, not just one. So the left arm comes big time, extends through. The left arm, left hand helps a ton. So it needs to come through as she's hitting that stroke in a low to high motion. And I think, yeah, I need to send her. I think Catherine and I did a two hand back end, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, another uh, another great question out there. Uh, do we have time for a couple more here, Simone? Yeah, absolutely. Another question from Lala here, and she wants to know, during a fast volley exchange at the net, do you try to beat mm -hmm. your opponent by continuing the exchange or try to reset by dropping the ball into a dink? It depends. <laughs> know your audience. Uh, and what I mean by that is, do I believe, uh, for me personally, do I believe that I can beat that person uh, hands-wise, like, you know, mano a mano, like, can I beat that person by counter-attacking? Then absolutely, I'm going to counter. Uh, if, and also the situation that I'm in. So there is, again, variables here. So if, let's say, the ball is linear, uh, meaning that the ball is staying at this level, okay, they are not hitting from up down. Because if they're hitting from up down, I am defending. So at that point, I am thinking, hoping that I can put a ball in the kitchen or just put the ball back in play. Then it's just defense, hope for the best. But if it's linear, then absolutely it's going to be judgment based on my opponent. So if I feel that I can win by countering, then I'll counter. If I believe that, oh, I'm not in position or there, they have faster hands than I do, I'm not like I'm not going to beat this person going head to head, then most likely, okay, I'm going to reset. Now, if again, if they decide to attack and their ball, they attack, but their ball is going up, uh, I don't care who it is, I am countering. And even if it's, you know, some like in mixed doubles sometimes against a guy, even if I feel like, okay, he might get the ball back, I just feel like at that point we're gaining, gaining an advantage. So it all depends. Well, not all, but there's so many things that are variables into that, going into that. Great. Um, it looks like Lala so. has a follow-up question here on that. <laughs> Um, and that has to do with, you said you mentioned the audience. What do you mean? Can you, are you referring to just, uh, depending on whether you think my you opponent. can beat them? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. My opponent. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, when I refer to know your audience is my, my opponent. Um, yeah. So that if I, if I know that my opponent, again, it depends on their strengths, um, and their weaknesses. So. I feel like uh, that's all the questions that we have so far. A lot of great ones came in here. Awesome. And I want to thank you, everybody. And the one thing that I would like to kind of just hopefully create some excitement here, I've uh, been working along with DECO. Uh, we've been working on putting together uh, a at-home tournament uh, where many of the pros uh, have uh, confirmed that they're going to be participating. Uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of different skills. Some are going to be for fun. Uh, some of some of them are definitely going to be to embarrass us. Uh, I know for a fact that I will be embarrassing myself as I am not uh, that skilled with some trick shots. Uh, but it will be for fun and it will be for charity. We're going to be doing uh, some collaboration uh, to everything it will be, um, be for donations. So, uh, and the, the information for that we're going to be uh, putting out soon. Uh, but ultimately, what we're looking to do is just, you know, uh, we are going to have a, a pickleball get together. Uh, I know everybody is missing each other and, you know, everybody wants to go back out and play. Uh, but this is something that we figure we can we can be together uh, through the cyber world. Uh, thanks to you, Eddie, uh, because you are in charge of that. Oh, and uh, and what we'll do. Oh, yeah, that's all on you. And uh, what we'll do, uh, you know, like I said, still working on details, but we will uh, be posting all of that coming up this week. Uh, and hopefully we'll get uh, um, what, is, what is it that we call it? The Easter Bowl Pickleball uh, uh, Championship. Uh, so it will be uh, next weekend. Hopefully we'll be able to do uh, Friday and Saturday um, before Easter on Sunday. So that is the plan. I'm excited. All right. And do we have a winner? Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Let me go ahead and do the random drawing here. And drum roll. 
Congratulations to Katie Duvaux. You are the winner there you go. of a brand new Prince Paddle. Thank you to Prince Pickleball awesome. and pickleballcentral.com. Uh, Katie, all you have to do is send an email to Karen at pickleballcentral.com with your details, and Karen will get that out to you. So congratulations, Katie, on that. And thanks to you, Eddie. I know this is uh, the efforts that you put in to put this together, uh, and hopefully we'll continue to do that. I think for this week, we'll prepare for for the for the event that we have coming up in the weekend. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I'll say for myself that if you guys have any questions or anything, um, I am here. And uh, the easiest way to get in touch with me is through Facebook Messenger. Uh, feel free uh, to send a message. And if you have any questions or anything, uh, and if I didn't address a question, just please let me know. Awesome. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye and enjoy the rest of your Sunday.